welcome to everyone who's here with us this evening. I think we've got a very interesting uh, opportunity to listen to some eminent scientists and uh, medical researchers about the work that they've been doing. It's very interesting, isn't it, that um, 15, 16 months ago, we thought perhaps that this virus might come and go, as many others do, or become a, a lesser quality virus in the community. But that's not been the case. We're in an environment now where potentially uh, we may see further changes to the virus. Um, how do we deal with that? What is our research telling us about what we've already done and how we can change and modify that? So um, I'm very pleased to be able to have the opportunity to introduce to you our um, speakers, uh, who I will then ask to join us on the um, chairs, and we'll ask some questions of them, and then we'll have some questions for the audience uh, after that. So can I first introduce to you Professor, Associate Professor Paul Bartley, he's the Director of Infectious Diseases at the Wesley Hospital, and an Associate Professor at the University of Queensland. Paul's specialist interests are infectious immunocompromised hosts, hospital-acquired infections, and molecular microbiology. Uh, Professor John Fraser is with us tonight as the Director of Intensive Care at St Andrews Hospital, founded the Critical Care Research Group, which I understand is now the largest acute care multidisciplinary group in Australia. I did ask uh, John what he did in his spare time, and he mentioned to me that between two and five, he was trying to get some sleep in the morning. But other than that, he's been pretty busy. Amongst his many, many credentials, Professor Fraser has recently assumed the presidency of the Asia Pacific Extracorporal Life Support Organization and is co-chair of the Queensland Cardiovascular Research Network. Associate Professor Labasi, is an intensive care specialist and researcher working at St Andrews War Memorial Hospital, the Wesley Hospital, and the Critical Care Research Group. He's an active member of the Critical Care Section of the American Thoracic Society and the American Society of Critical Care Medicine. His research currently focuses on the management of COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit. Professor Bala Venkatesh, is the Director of Intensive Care at the Wesley Hospital, is a preeminent specialist in intensive care medicine at the Princess Alexandra Hospital, Brisbane, Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at the University of Queensland and the University of New South Wales, and Professor Fellow at the George Institute of Global Health in Sydney, Australia. So um, Professor Venkacek doesn't get too much sleep either. He's a, an extensive experience in running global research studies, and it would be wonderful to hear him talk about some of that. And he's run the largest study of steroids in septic shock to date. Professor Anand Gutman is uh, the executive director, as Charlie mentioned, and emerging science lead across uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia for Pfizer. And he's an adjunct professor at the Institute of Molecular Biosciences, the University of Queensland. Dr. Gutem has an immunology background and prior to his role uh, at Pfizer, he was a senior executive roles at Novo Nordisk in Denmark and at Progen and Pharma, Pharma Mexica in Australia. And, and our final speaker for tonight will be Dr. Stephanie Tayak. And um, Dr. Tayak is a senior research fellow at QUT, Australian Centre for Health Services Innovation who has worked with Professor Stephen McPhail and Dr. Bridget Abel on health services research and implement, uh, implementation science initiatives. Most recently, she and other members from that research group supported Wesley Medical Research Project, which aimed to improve the mental health of people living with, uh, within rural and remote regions. And Dr. Tayak's research focus includes working with families, and health professionals to design health interventions that support clinical decision making, communication and quality of life. So I'm sure you'll uh, all ha have the impression that we have a very eminent group of people for us to uh, uh, listen to tonight. 
Can I uh, ask my first question to Professor Bartley? Um, Professor, I'd like you to talk a little bit, if you could, about in, uh, as an infectious disease specialist, can you provide us with your insights into the management of COVID-19 globally and in Australia? I think it's fairly clear that this is a global pandemic of historic proportions that's causing immense social disruption on a global scale um, to rival that of 1918 influenza pandemic. Um, it's interesting that in the first paragraph of my textbook on coronaviruses um, that was printed well before this pandemic, uh, it talks about recurrent cycles of respiratory infection every two to three years. Um, and so I think that there doesn't give anyone any cause for hope that this is going to be done anytime soon, uh, particularly without a vaccine. I think we've seen many examples where appropriately timed, well-targeted public health interventions have been immensely successful. Um, and I think we've seen areas where there's been decay in quality of public health services um, fail uh, and in areas where public health infrastructure has yet to become rigidly um, implemented, uh, yet to work. I think we, it's in a very exciting time, particularly if you're in a society that has good access to reliable vaccines, and we've seen several deployed in many places around the world. So in those areas, it's a good time to be alive. Uh, and so, um, plus, I think in the long term, we're going to learn a lot more about acute inflammation and the basic biology of it. Uh, so um, there's swings and roundabouts and a lot of learnings from this. Um, I think Australia particularly has been successful with pub many public health interventions, particularly lockdowns, the um, societies in 1918 that could introduce shutdowns and enforce them, weren't able to maintain them for any longer than six weeks. Uh, and uh, many places in Australia have been able to do it either repeatedly for longer than that in aggregate or an example in Victoria for uh, 200 days or however many months that was. Uh, and obviously those things are wearing off and we're starting to see consequences of that. Plainly, public health can't do it by itself, so the vaccines are going to have to do the heavy lifting. Mm. Um, so. um, Professor Bartley, would you like to give us just a little bit of uh, your thoughts on um, how we may perhaps have to live with the virus longer term? Someone said to me recently that um, eradication was the strategy. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on well, you did touch on the issue. Well, eradication, in my opinion, eradication is a nice idea, but really it's an adolescent fantasy. Um, I think there's been a, a nice example in New Zealand where they were able to eliminate transmission on the mainland and one plane load from, well, anywhere in Australia, but probably Sydney, um, um, has um, blown that apart. And that's all it would take here. So even if it were eliminatable on mainland Australia or any other country, all you need is one plane load or a ship or uh, an illegal border crossing of whatever sort, um, and that uh, will unravel that. So I don't think that's going to be a meaningful endpoint. Um, the quarantine fatigue and the shutdown fatigue, whatever you want to call it, is uh, starting to cause real harm to many people. Um, and uh, whilst collectively as a society, we've probably survived worse in days gone by, that's probably because there was no alternative. Uh, and here we have some valid alternatives that will allow us to live with it. I mean, the basic maxim in infectious diseases is adapt or die. And uh, part of the adaptation has got to include vaccination. Thank you very much. Professor Fraser. Uh, your study has involved hundreds of sites globally with the aim of characterising COVID-19 in critically ill ICU patients who require ventilation. And I understand around 15,000 patients now. Uh, can you please provide an update on the um, platform you're using to capture this information? And what are some specific outcomes that have been achieved? to inform the management of COVID-19 patients in ICU? Sure, thank you. So firstly, I'm just the person at the front, uh, the, the people doing the real work are back in the labs. We started this because um, as the chair of the Asia Pacific, we started being asked in January, February last year, in fact, early January, even before the virus had been named, how, we should, how our colleagues across Asia Pacific should manage the ICU. And we had no idea, and to be honest, neither did they. So 
we were protected, as we still relatively are here in Queensland, and I agree with Paul, uh, great credit to our public health people. We were protected, but we thought, well, no one's quite sure what to do if we collect data. Uh, perhaps we can help guide it. We're in a relatively luxurious position of not being harmed by the disease. Uh, we convinced Jackie Swain, myself, Jan Luigi and Jackie lead this. We convinced Jackie it would probably be three or four countries max. Definitely wouldn't go past five. Uh, so that shows uh, my lack of insight. Uh, so bit by bit, we started collecting data um, from colleagues initially. It's about 14 hours to collect one patient's data. And our colleagues started collecting that data pro bono, uh, despite the fact they're working in the midst of a pandemic, despite the fact they're working in PPE in, in some really rich, but also some really poor countries where there's no air conditioning. Um, because we all realised we didn't know what to do, and it's in the intensive care, so you're not going to get much sicker. So. Um, we were fortunate we started chatting to IBM. We wanted to make something that was free, that people, regardless of country and race, colour, creed and, and income, could input the data. So we put the data into REDCap. OSHA helped, we got a fantastic statistician called Nicole White and Adrian Barnett, the ex-president of the Stats Society in UQ with Simon Forsyth. We built the database over a weekend in January before the virus was named. And then IBM came on board and helped us co-develop a dashboard. So some of us, Perhaps those in Uniting Care Health maybe don't get the IT support uh, that we always want. But with IBM, they were fantastic. We said, we need to create a dashboard that people can use. And they said, well, what did we want? We said, well, we don't really know. We're not getting hit by it. But we gave them 20 clinicians from around the world, from New York, from uh, Rwanda, from uh, France, from Germany, from Taiwan, from rich and poor, and said, create a dashboard that is useful to these people, regardless of how wealthy they are and how average their, their conditions are. So 20 odd senior clinicians that were collecting the data for us worked with IBM and co-developed a dash where we can, uh, so the data goes into REDCap, which is easy and free, and then is fed, de-identified via UQ, de-identified onto the dash so that they can look at um, global data, uh, they can look at their local data, but they can also, if they're stuck and they've got a patient in bed three at three in the morning, whose oxygenation is 85 and their kidney function is X and Y, and they can start to look and see what the likelihood is of success. So this is what the clinicians out there wanted. IBM were fantastic, um, and Amazon Web Service, we started to try and develop a tool where we, rather than take 14 hours from our clinician colleagues who were exhausted, they'd want to go home early, see their kids, and uh, maybe have some dinner. So we started trying to develop a voice system of putting the data in. It hasn't worked yet. Um, but the dashboard works really well. And then Gates Foundation has uh, started to work with us as well and said we can, with the Gates power, et cetera, and now the fact that we're up to 15,000 patients, including the Spanish data, it's the equivalent of, we reckon it's about 35 million data points on ICU uh, globally. So the, now the, the dash is moving with IBM's blessing to the Gates Foundation. Um, so our, our primary aim was to try and create something that was useful to the clinician at the bedside. Publications would come, and I'll talk about it briefly. Publications would come, but they had something that was a useful resource, particularly early last year, to try and help them see what would happen in the majority of patients that were ventilated that were 90, or what would happen, how many patients got dialysis and were diabetic. And this is all very, very visualized. And it, it was beautifully co-developed. Again, IBM did it for nothing, probably about three or four million dollars. Uh, and Prince Charles Hospital and Foundation was really good as well as the Wesley research. So that's been an incredible asset to the people out there. We're just redeveloping it now with Gates. And then Wellcome Trust has come to the party as well and said, this is great, but we, all, we, we made a number of subgroups. So at the start, when we didn't understand about the disease, it was just generic intensive care data. Then we saw that it was a higher instance of renal failure. So then now there's a subgroup of COVID and kidney disease. And then neurological disorder, and COVID's quite common and we're co-working on this. The nice idea I thought that happened, and Paul alluded to it, was that the medics, it was more about we rather than I. Mm -hmm. So we had a number of different centres saying, we want to use this data, and it's their data, not ours, we're just looking after it. We want to use this data for this study. And rather than do five independent studies, we managed to get people to work together. So Johns Hopkins, along with Chiara Robbie in Italy, are looking at the neurological sub substructures. John Laffey's, our friends in Ireland, are working in renal with uh, some of our colleagues in Australia. So bit by bit, subgroups, and then the low-middle-income countries 
who are getting uh, much harder hit than we are. I mean, Paul talked about vaccinations at the moment. There's 100 vaccines have been administered per 100 people in the rich countries, but in the poorer countries, it's 1.5 vaccines have been administered per 100 people. Mm -hmm. So what we're actually doing is creating a variant factory. It's bad medicine, it's bad politics, and it's bad science. So they have been hit harder with less resources than we have. So we're now modifying the DASH. Again, it's been run out of Kenya and South Africa and Indonesia. We've got 55 countries. So they're rebuilding and optimizing the dashboard for people in low middle income countries. So trying to, trying to get something that's global, but also specific for, for them as well. Mm. well. Thank you very much. That's a great overview of the work you're doing and much larger than you initially thought. Yeah. But all <laughs> We wouldn't do it again. <laughs> no. It's way too hard. Just as well, then you didn't realise that until you got further into the study, because that's an excellent opportunity with a multidisciplinary team. Mm. And as you say, doctors working together. Mm. So thank you very much. Um, Professor Labasi, uh, you're now almost two years since COVID, um, COVID pandemic emerged and the concept of long COVID has surfaced. What are we seeing in terms of general health and quality of life for people who have been discharged from the ICU with long COVID? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting question. And uh, uh, well, let me start just uh, acknowledging the, the, the organizer of this uh, night uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here and particularly among this uh, brilliant clinician and uh, uh, such a level of expertise. So uh, in order to understand long COVID, uh, in terms of the definition of COVID, uh, if uh, uh, you are being discharged from the ICU and uh, you have still symptoms after approximately four weeks uh, uh, from COVID, from the initial symptom that you had at home, uh, very likely you are developing long COVID. If uh, the symptoms are beyond the 12 weeks, you are developing the long COVID syndrome, which is something that uh, we know very little about. And uh, that was uh, the main purpose uh, of a study that we are running, uh, so-called uh, after core. So uh, for what we know at this stage, uh, uh, approximately between five and 10% of the patient uh, who are hospitalized for COVID, they will develop uh, some persistent symptoms and uh, the recovery of their organs will not be uh, absolutely uh, proficient. And uh, if, uh, uh, unfortunately, you have a, a severe COVID and you're going to do the intensive care unit, that incidence increase uh, up to 30, 40%. We have an interesting uh, uh, early report from uh, the Halfred Hospital that they've shown that 30% of their population from the ICU, they still have symptoms at three months after COVID. So uh, in this context, uh, uh, if we look at, for instance, the United Kingdom, uh, as we speak, uh, they, they, there are uh, already 100 clinics uh, uh, supported by the NHS in the UK in order to manage uh, such a burden that we will face uh, in the upcoming years. Because uh, with uh, a global uh, uh, pandemic, we will have uh, several patients who will have long COVID in the upcoming years. In this context, uh, uh, John and I and other uh, brilliant uh, investigator, Dr. Wilde from St. Andrews and Dr. Swen that uh, John mentioned from University of Queensland, uh, develop uh, a, a protocol uh, that is called AfterCore that will follow up uh, patient after the ICU discharge up to two years in order to understand uh, what are the symptoms, what is the recovery of the organ dysfunction and uh, what will happen to this patient after they walk outside the uh, ICU. 
And uh, well, we, we had tremendous support from uh, uh, Wesley Medical Research, from uh, uh, the Prince Charles Foundation, University of Queensland, uh, and uh, we wouldn't be here without their support. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, the network, this is something that is absolutely linked uh, to the other network, the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium Network. We have at the moment uh, more than 25 sites across uh, 13 countries uh, across the six continents uh, that they are describing patient uh, with long COVID uh, up to two years. Okay, And we are planning to present the first preliminary studies uh, uh, in the upcoming uh, American Thoracic Society meeting in the United States. Uh, we still cannot say about uh, the, actual, uh, uh, the actual results, unfortunately, but uh, let me tell you a story uh, about what happened a few days ago. Of course, uh, we sleep uh, very few hours, and and I was on the phone uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning with some collaborators in Argentina, and uh, uh, the main challenge uh, in the inclusion of this patient was uh, uh, that uh, there are there were many patients in their 50s without any previous uh, uh, medical condition, that after COVID, after ICU admission, they were not able to go back uh, to the hospital to do the entire panel of assessment that we require for our study, because they cannot drive, they cannot uh, use public transportation, and they are just uh, with a condition that, uh, uh, as I said, uh, we do not know with the recovery, and we do not know. And unfortunately, these are patients, uh, given that we have Pfizer here, these are patients uh, that uh, they were not so fortunate uh, like we are to have uh, the possibility to be vaccinated when they were uh, affected by this disease. So let me conclude that. Uh, and thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Dr. Labasi. You're also talking about the fact that your wife and you are expecting a child very shortly. So right, right, you'll right. be able We're to look October. after the child early <laughs> uh, during the uh, <laughs> evening hours, <Yeah. laughs> as well as I'll answer telephone calls. To to look after <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bala Venkacek, um, Professor, you talked about the study that you've been working on. Uh, was designed to examine the impact of COVID-19 from the perspective of the healthcare workforce, which is really important, and on preventing the infection. Um, noting that this work commenced before the vaccine was produced, can you give us an update on your research and tell us about the impact of COVID-19 in India, where uh, it was one of your major sites? Thank you, Professor Fleming, and I would like to start by acknowledging Wesley Medical Research and all the donors which, uh, who allow us to do this work. Um, I just Before I answer your question specifically, I just want to give you a perspective of what COVID is in um, resource-limited settings. So there have been 32 million confirmed cases in India, and the real estimate is somewhere between 300 to 400 million infections. That's the real estimate in India, because but they don't have the same testing capabilities as as we do, and the um, and it's also important when we report research that there has to be global generalizability of any research findings. So research conducted in in healthcare systems like ours, where it's well resourced, the same results may not be valid if it's conducted in a resource-limited setting because their healthcare uh, approaches are different, access to healthcare are different. So, we, um, so, so what the Wesley Medical Research support allowed us to do was in fact gave us a platform to study four different questions, which was very critical. And I will go through one by one. The first one was looking at the question of hydroxychloroquine which was very topical very early in the piece during COVID-19, and both as a preventer and as a treatment for COVID-19 infection. And we tested healthcare workers in India. Our plan was to enroll 8,000 healthcare workers, and it was very difficult to do that. 
uh, for a variety of reasons, which I'll allude to later on. Uh, but we ended up having to stop the trial after 450 healthcare workers were enrolled. Um, and interestingly, just to put things into perspective, at the same time as Wesley Medical Research supported our work, there were two other international trials of hydroxychloroquine, one by federal, federal government funded from here with a budget of $3 million in Melbourne and a University of Oxford trial, uh, which was also well funded. And they managed to enroll with such extensive funding support, they only enrolled 270 healthcare workers from Melbourne and 220 from Oxford. So it's a, it just tells you the challenges that people had in trying to enroll into this particular study. But importantly, what we showed was that um, although it was not, um, um, it didn't have the statistical power to show the results, we showed that the healthcare, uh, the, the COVID-19 infection rate in healthcare workers is about 5%, and hydroxychloroquine did not have an effect as we would expect. And, um, and we also examined the role of the BCG vaccine because that was thought to be a protective um, in some stages of COVID. So we tested that as well and it did not have any effect on COVID-19 development. We then had a platform at the same time. This platform helped us to study a second question, which was looking at corticosteroids. Steroids are a group of drugs which have been tested in COVID-19, and the only drug, the only drug which has been shown to be effective in COVID. And the UK group identified this, and they tested a dose of six milligrams in their cohort. So we did a large randomized control trial in India and in Europe, uh, looking at comparing six milligrams versus 12 milligrams. And again, I want to emphasize that the platform that we had with the, with the hydroxychloroquine study helped us to develop this collaboration. We enrolled 1,000 patients, and we showed that 12 milligram was actually better than 6 milligrams. And in fact, for every 20 patients that we treat with 12 milligrams, we save one life. So the results are now being reviewed by a high-impact journal and will be in the public domain very soon. The third trial was the... Um, the ASCOT trial, again, what's called the Australasian COVID-19 trial, which was funded um, uh, by the federal government as well as I think the Wesley Medical Research were also very keen to support this at the time. And they could not enroll many patients in Australia because there, were, there was not a high COVID load. And they came to us through the George Institute and we have enrolled 900 patients and the trial is still continuing and going well. And finally, we also tested the proof of principle of a 3D printed mask, an oxygen delivery device, because ventilators are in short supply mm. and particularly in resource limited settings. And so we just want to test whether this would reduce the need for requiring a mechanical ventilation device. And we again used the same platform of our collaboration and we did a proof of principle study. And even in that small study, there was a big difference in the requirement for mechanical ventilation. And therefore, we are going for a definitive larger trial. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so I think the, 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 these trials have been very important and particularly doing them in resource limited settings have that level of generalizability, which adds to the robustness of all these results. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, as many of us would have seen on television, uh, the I Indian COVID experience has been a dreadful one for people who come from a country like Australia with every resource and every opportunity. So it's, it's a marvellous thing that you're doing to be working in that context Thank where you. it is really resource um, starved. Thank you very much. You. Professor Goodman. We're um, talking a little bit with you about the three vaccines available in Australia. We know that uh, uh, Pfizer is one of those, AstraZeneca, and the Australian government's just been talking about Moderna vaccine as well. Could you just walk us through a pro the process of vaccine development uh, and from Pfizer's perspective, and what we should expect to see over the next 12 months? First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's really nice to hear the clinical experiences from colleagues around here. This is really, really important. Uh, I'm not a clinician, I'm a research scientist. So how can I say? I can say this has been an exciting time being at Pfizer at this point because we were, we were doing things in days rather than months. Mm -hmm. 
So as you can imagine, uh, any vaccine in previous times would have taken seven to 10 years to develop. And here, what we did, uh, and AstraZeneca and Moderna, other, other people as well, so anybody who contributed to the vaccine development did a wonderful job. So we all appreciate each other very much. And I think all vaccines are effective. But being there and seeing from day one, the development uh, gives me goosebumps, to be honest. It's, it's, it was an amazing experience. Uh, how did it happen? So we were already working with BioNTech. That's, that's how it started, right? Mm. So we already had a collaboration actually through our function called Emerging Science and Innovation, where we already had scientific deal collaboration with them in October 18, well before we knew about the COVID, right? And we were working on mRNA with them. Mm. In December, we heard the murmurs that there was something going on. Uh, in 19, right? And in March, 8th of March, or around that time, uh, we signed the deal with BioNTech to work on COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Mm. And from that, that day onwards, the, it was an amazing journey because our CEO said, let's not worry about the money and we will not tied up to any government. We were free to do what we wanted to do. And our CEO was so motivating. Our R&D leadership was extremely motivating. Uh, within two months, we had the lead candidate. Less than two months, we had lead candidate that we wanted to try it out. I remember July, uh, now we know that date, but we got to see, uh, not see, but hear, that we had some preliminary data from our phase one, phase two. That's within three months of signing a deal. Mm. That there was some signs of efficacy uh, in a, I can't remember how many patients there were, or how many volunteers, not patients, yeah. volunteers. Uh, and at that note in July, our CEO said, we are just going to go to phase three. And we are going to recruit close to 50,000 people and see what the infection rate was in infected in the infection rate in these uh, otherwise healthy people. And you won't believe it, every two, three months we were hearing some news internally. Uh, you guys were hearing it in intermittently. Uh, I think the, the biggest day was in November uh, when we first heard that there was a 90% efficacy, which you all heard. Uh, that was a preliminary analysis uh, on the data. Literally a week later, full analysis was completed. So you can just imagine how much resources father was putting in. Before the phase three started, before the phase two started, our CEO and our manufacturing team had already invested billions in preparation for manufacturing and supply worldwide. And had committed that we will make over 100 million doses for United States within that year. Uh, that was the promise. So in November, when we heard that it was 90%, I remember I was on a call 11, 11 p.m. And uh, we just heard that news. It was crazy, I, can, I, I knew where I was. Mm. And uh, two weeks later, it became 95% when the full analysis was done. And at that point, the safety analysis was also done for emergency use authorization. And uh, two weeks later, we count days, 15 days, 11 days mm -hmm. later, it was submitted to the FDA, EU, for approval for emergency use authorization. And I think I put down dates there on December 2nd, uh, literally two, 160 days later from the time we signed the collaboration with uh, BioNTech on mRNA, uh, the first approval happened in, EU, in, in London, in, in UK, uh, from the UK health authorities. And literally nine days later, on a December 11th, FDA authorized that. And a few days later, EU on December 22nd. So every day we were hearing these mm. news. It was like amazing time to be there. And now, you know, only last week, 
uh, FDA has approved it for full, full usage. Mm -hmm. It means mm -hmm. that now it's available like any of the vaccines. Uh, and the advantage of that is that now people who were with skeptical about using emergency use authorization should feel much more secure because the data has now been much more heavily analyzed and looked at by the FDA and that vaccine is available. Uh, so it's been an extremely, <laughs> I would say, most exciting time in my life mm -hmm. uh, in terms of research. And being an immunologist, uh, of course, a lot of people suffering and a lot of deaths and a lot of uh, long COVID etc. happening. It's a once in a lifetime experience for an immunologist to see a real experiment happening. Uh, and then we are finding ways to treat it. Yeah. Uh, then the next question you asked me, what we're we doing in the next 12 months? Mm -hmm. You know, virus is so clever, it will keep changing. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will keep mutating. So we need to chase it out. Uh, so Pfizer is now working on uh, multiple variant uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, and we're working on other possible mutations out there. The second point that we're working on is uh, relating to treatment of long COVID or other diseases that you're going. So we have a phase two clinical, phase one, two clinical trial. And once again, we have committed unlimited resources for this molecule. This is a small molecule targeting one of the proteins on, on, the, on the virus side. And that is also going full phase three because the full resource phase three clinical trial for treatment uh, of the disease, which is much, much more important for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second, the final point is that I think we're also now doing clinical trials from young people, young kids from six months all to the year 12, because that's the that's group the, that has not yeah. yet been approved, yeah. right? Yeah. So you must have heard that, you know, the vaccines, Pfizer vaccines, Moderna as well, I think, uh, has been approved for 12 to 16 years old as well. Mm -hmm. So it's been the most exciting time uh, being in industry uh, and being an immunologist, seeing how we can actually so rapidly develop things. It'll change also the FDA mindsets, how, why should it take nine years to develop, to, yeah, to approve right. a drug. I think there'll be a lot of changes, positive changes about drug approvals following this. Yep. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. And uh, uh, great that you were feeling a bit like a rock star there. <laughs> Not a rock star, it's just very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our final uh, speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Tayak. And um, we're going to ask her some questions about um, COVID-19 in the context of mental health. Um, many of us um, listen and hear about the consequences of mental well-being and the impact that COVID has had on um, people's mental health. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on the risk versus the benefits of current restrictions on the mental health and well-being of the general population, those who are locked down quickly and for long periods of time. And are these mental health concerns being taken into fish, uh, account when we're implementing the elimination strategy or something else? Yeah, so this is, um, you know, my thoughts are that it is actually quite complex. Um, so we've got data out there that indicates that the elimination strategy is probably, um, probably does it, it is the better strategy if we take into account, you know, reduced road traffic accidents, uh, the impact on health as well as costs. However, there's also information out there that indicates that we do have, we've got vulnerable populations and we've got uh, very specific groups who are much more vulnerable than others. And I think we'd, we don't know enough about that yet. A lot of our, the information that's out there, to my knowledge, is based on early COVID data as well. So we don't know what's happened since then. We don't understand everything um, since Delta has come along. Um, and we know that people out there, there are mental health issues. So some of the international work that's um, come about, um, I think there's eight, eight countries that we have very good data on, but it's from early COVID data. And that shows that, yes, there has been an impact on things like anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. And then we've got some good Australian data, um, but it's in very select areas. So we know that there's increased um, medication use. Um, 
for mental health issues. And we also know access to mental health services has really changed. So compared to like 2019, there's been like a 10 to 30% increase in services. And I don't know if any of you, so just in the news recently, we've heard about Lifeline. So Lifeline, it's an organisation that's been going for 57 years or so. But in August, there's been four days that they've had the highest numbers ever of access. So they, these sorts of things tell us that something is changing um, in relation to people's well-being and their need to seek support. And I guess based on that sort of information um, and work, we've partnered with um, Wesley Medical Research to uh, had, have had a unique opportunity to look at rural and uh, regional mental health during COVID. So, and that's one of the vulnerable groups. And we know that access to services or things aren't quite the same in those areas of Australia. And that's one of the vulnerable populations we know are affected um, by COVID and the restrictions that come about. So what we've had the opportunity of doing is in the middle of last year, we went into the Bowen Basin, um, which is an area where there was an, a need to develop a new service. Um, things weren't quite uh, working there and we got to partner and talk to a lot of the communities there and a lot of organisations. And two of the key things that we found were that um, not only was there a lack of access to services, but some of the services there, they weren't um, delivering mental health services um, in the right way and at the right time for people. So people were telling us stories like um, that there, in one town there was a mental health service, but it was in the middle of town. And so people were reluctant to go there because they, there was a huge car park out the front. So when they parked their car there, everyone in town knew they were visiting that service. So they said, well, who's no, none of us are going to go there. So the service was there, but they just weren't using it because of the stigma they felt was associated with that. And then there were other services, they were funded, but no one had ever heard of them in town. So they had no visibility. So they'd, they'd arrived, but they didn't tell anyone they were there. So no one could refer to them. Um, so these stories came out over and over again. So we really got a very good feel for what people thought worked and what they didn't. And we've now developed a new model. Um, so that model, two of the key things in that are that we, we provide a support person, so a navigator a care navigator that helps people to navigate where they need to get to. Um, and also that that person helps them to find the service that works for them. And sometimes that's telehealth. So, so we're looking at introducing telehealth services, but we know that doesn't meet everyone's needs because in rural areas, up to 8% of the population, they won't have an internet service. And we know certain groups of people like farmers, they don't really like connecting um, using telehealth. So it's part of the solution. So we've tailored a new service um, to meet the needs using different um, things that sort of a package of services that weren't all brought together in the past. And we're at, we just, um, the first Care Navigator has just started this week in Moranbar. So we're really excited that that started. And we're really hoping that we'll be able to roll this out into other towns in that area. And we think it really does have the potential to be scaled up much broader because a lot of the, issue, the issues we were hearing about, they're not just in rural and re regional areas. We hear about them in metropolitan areas as well. So we think there's a lot of potential with this sort of model. So we're just looking at funding to be able to roll it out in different areas and scale it up. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we've seen this evening is a great example of research uh, that's going on both at the um, scientific end of the spectrum as well as at the community end and everywhere in between. And what's also wonderful is the opportunity that some of that research can be then put into practice. We're learning from that research. It gives us evidence to make changes and developments that uh, influence the quality of the work we do. And so I'd, I'd very much like you, if you could, just to thank all of our presenters for a wonderful uh, journey through COVID-19. Thank you.
I am going to ask if any of our audience would like to ask any questions. Yes, please. Question for Dr. Gordon. We've had a, a wild ride through this. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing. Um, uh, for those of us who've been vaccinated, the next question is, well, when will you for a boost? Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of press about boost availability. What um, data will governments be relying on determining when a boost is due? And we'll be one size fits all or not. So uh, clearly we're, we're testing that uh, at Pfizer, third booster. I think uh, now I have to be a little bit more careful because I cannot remember whether it was publicly disclosed or not disclosed. But uh, what I can say is that the third booster is being tested in people and also we're looking at the general population data as well. Uh, it looks like it, that the antibody response uh, wanes. We start to go down from our six to eight month time frame. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have antibodies, that you will not make response when the virus comes back to you uh, because immunological memory is very, very you know, sharp. It will, it will wake up within a day or short time. So Yes, so I think a six to eight month time period is a, uh, a third booster. Uh, and I think you will soon hear some more things uh, that are being discussed with the FDA. Uh, but data is coming rapid and fast, like the original vaccine uh, data. So I think we, are, we feel very confident that there will be a third or, you know, booster. Uh, uh, I think we all got lucky that uh, we have a, a mRNA technology that was so untested before. And now we have such a, an immense possibilities for uh, protecting ourselves. Just an actually, I was really impressed by the idea of, of just doubling the dose of steroid and improving patient survivability to that extent. Um, and steroids are cheap in, in comparison to virtually every other medication given in intensive care, I believe apart from water perhaps. Um, so you've gone to 12, is more better? Can you go higher? It's a, a terrific question because the, um, so, so what um, uh, COVID-19 does, it causes lung inflammation and leads to a condition called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So interestingly, before COVID happened, um, the, the group from France had done some work and had shown that in people with non-COVID-19 ARDS, a dose of 20 milligrams of dexamethasone was in fact superior to a lower dose. So after when the six milligram dose came out and then when we tested all our clinicians, uh, about whether we should go for this, compare six versus 20. The concern was because the fung reports about black fungus, which circulated in the media, which is the, all the fungal infections, which can happen in patients with, uh, who are on steroids and have got COVID. They were reluctant to go to this 20 milligram dose. They said, let's go for the 12. So we compared the six versus 12 and 12 was clearly superior to the six. But, and, but, Interestingly, the black fungus infection rates were very similar between the two groups, six and the 12. So it had equivalent, uh, it was certainly more efficacious, but with a similar side effect profile. So that might be the next trial. Uh, so this might be a question for Prof Gautam or maybe for Paul. Uh, what does this process of developing an mRNA vaccine mean for other mRNA viruses and what might we hope for as the uh, other bonus points for this kind of activity? Uh, what I can say is that <clears throat> since, the, since we have established mRNA uh, expertise, Pfizer is actually putting huge amount of resources in mRNA uh, 
not vaccine, but mRNA therapies. Uh, because you can imagine that cancer antigens that are difficult to treat, uh, difficult to develop vaccines against, uh, mRNA also does, it actually tickles the immune system. It's, it's not just the virus specific, when you inject with mRNA, uh, the body gets excited, just seeing mRNA itself. So any mRNA will do that. This is called immune stimulation innately. And then it transfers the COVID-19 and it, that just boosts it beyond uh, to different level. Same thing could happen with, you know, combination of cancer uh, proteins that are associated with disease. So we're looking at those possibilities, how mRNA uh, coding for those proteins could be used as vaccines. That's one thing. The other thing we're looking at, many genetic diseases have one or two proteins missing. Uh, and of course, gene therapy is something that we all look at, uh, where you give gene therapy and you forget for five years and everything is fine. But sometimes that also is associated with side effects, continuously expressing that protein. So one can imagine that in short term boosts for certain diseases, I, I don't want to name them because I don't want to be quoted. Uh, <laughs> but you can imagine that you just want to express that protein for a very short time, like maybe two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And that's what mRNA does. So when you get injected with COVID-19 vaccine, you have expression in the system for a few days or few weeks at the most. It means that you can express that protein that is missing. And then, of course, genetic diseases. We're looking at autoimmune diseases. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, Pfizer is hiring a huge number of people. This is publicly known. Uh, we're investing a huge amount of uh, resources for mRNA therapies. It doesn't have to be vaccine. It could be something else. It could be modulating mRNA itself. So it's huge potential. If I can add to that, um, I'm not in receipt of any money from any drug companies, but I'm susceptible to offers. Um, <laughs> there was a nice review in Nature from February on your opposition with Moderna. Uh, we were supporting each other. supporting each other, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, going into their history with RNA vaccines and I think for the nucleic acid vaccines in general, it's like the story of McDonald's. It was an overnight success that was actually 25 years in the making. Uh, and Moderna, I think at that stage, had vaccines, RNA vaccines with a similar or same technology as their um, Comirnaty, sorry, not Comirnaty, um, their, their COVID vaccine, that's yours. Uh, and uh, they've also had vaccines for RSV and influenza uh, in human trials held up by regulatory concerns about Will it integrate into your DNA? Will it get into your germline? Will your children come out with three noses? Uh, all this sort of thing. And um, so COVID's assisted in kicking those concerns into touch. Personally, I'm looking forward to this sort of technology or something very similar, making a whole pile of chickens around the world redundant uh, because our influenza vaccine technology is still based on technology that was state of the art in the 1930s uh, where influenza virus is cultured in embryonated eggs. Uh, and every year there's two big meetings to sort out what the last strains in the southern hemisphere was to generate the strains for the north hemisphere vaccine and conversely at the end of the northern winter for the southern hemisphere. Now companies like Pfizer and Moderna can retool their vaccines within three months at a PC um, and uh, there's a whole lot fewer chickens that need to be looked after. Uh, so um, I really think there's a huge future for this sort of technology, uh, particularly when the cold chain gets cracked, which I think, imagine is Correct. probably a major priority. I mean, uh, now the Pfizer vaccine could be kept in the fridge for seven, eight days and minus 24 months. Uh, so initially it was minus 70, which was a big issue. Minus 20 is no issue for anywhere, to be honest. So I think, uh, and we're working on other formulations which, which could be kept at room temperature for a very long time. So things are improving very rapidly. Delivery systems are, you know, getting better and better. And we're working in multiple collaborations. BioNTech was one, but we're working with many different companies on, across the whole value chain. Thank you. Phil, it's my name. I'm a volunteer at the hospital. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a professional lady that I've known for some years today. Uh, she's probably in her late 40s. It's questions to do with the apprehension and hesitancy that a lot of people have regarding being vaccinated. Now, she has two children and she's pregnant with her third. 
She, during her prenatal consultations, has been coming across both government health advisors and also advisors from the private industry. Um, I asked her if she's been vaccinated. She said she wanted to be, but she's had conflicting advice from the two different arms of medical advice. Uh, the government advisors were suggesting that she should wait until she'd had her third child before being vaccinated. However, their private advisors were suggesting that she should go ahead and have it now. And she was interested particularly in the Pfizer vaccine. I wondered if you have any thoughts on how this apprehension and hesitancy can be um, speeded up. I see it in a lot of other examples. Thank you. By getting more COVID into Queensland. <laughs> yeah. I mean that. Vaccine hesitancy has been around since the days of Edward, Gen Edward Jenner in Victorian England, uh, where uh, several members of the Church of England uh, condemned it as sinful because animal products were being inserted into humans. Uh, presumably those parsons were vegetarian. Um, now, so that was when beef uh, cowpox strains uh, that uh, Jenna noted made milkmaids immune were inoculated into humans, including one of Vicky and Bertie's kids um, at the time. Now, the vaccine hesitancy has taken all sorts of forms over the years. Um, some of it based on fear, some of it based on random human behaviour, uh, some of it based on bad science. Uh, some of it spread by my colleagues. Uh, and uh, one could almost invent a new disease called Terror Australis uh, with OR instead of RRA. Uh, and uh, with the pathogen being Vaxevria vasillatis with an R naught somewhere between chicken pox and measles. Uh, the problem with that uncertainty is it's spread across the South Pacific in particular and to other countries that have less options in terms of vaccine access. So as a result, people are either at risk of COVID or dying uh, while there's live vaccine options in the fridge. Uh, so unfortunately, um, I, and I think also by way of observation, the two states in Australia with the most efficient vaccine uptake are the two states that have been uh, hit hardest by COVID. And on an international scale, it's been more of a warm hug than a clubbing. Uh, so um, I think one thing that orients people is a real and present fear. People have a real proximity virus. If they see successful public health interventions, and these have been outrageously successful, then they think, oh, that's good. I've not been inconvenienced too much. I can get on with my life. In terms of the obstetric setting, uh, all of us have been hesitant about vaccination or indeed any medications in pregnant women. And there's been a long history of uh, therapeutic hesitancy in the setting of pregnancy with respect to therapeutic trials and new medicines. Um, and that's not just vaccines. So the initial advice from the College of Obstetricians in consultation with the CMO was, was up to the individual woman's uh, belief and conscience and in terms of her other health parameters. Uh, there are many women who are pregnant who have type 2 diabetes. There are many women who are pregnant who are obese. That represents a significant constellation of problems in the Pacific Islands and for large parts of Australia. So there is a role for vaccination there, and it's pleasing to see the trials, particularly for Pfizer, demonstrating safety and efficacy in the setting of pregnancy. So I think that data just needs, needs to be patiently explained and reiterated. Uh, there does need to be a sense of purpose on behalf of my colleagues in encouraging the hesitant patients to be vaccinated uh, and complimenting the hesitant on finally making decisions. I had a patient today who's not pregnant uh, but um, muscled up the courage to get her vaccination three weeks ago and wishes she'd had it done months earlier. Uh, so um, you know, I think we've just got to be persistent and resolved that this is the way to go. Uh, I thought I was coming to the function tonight. What should I tell her when I speak to her? Get vaccinated. I think the other thing is just the Royal Court, so Paul's right, the guidelines weren't, the guidelines weren't up and down, but the Royal College of Obstetrics um, has now said everyone, yep. every phase, and the Australian guidelines have now changed. So everyone at every phase, so they can look at the guidelines from the expert bodies that have all said, everyone that's pregnant, the risk of COVID when you're pregnant is so much higher than the risk of vaccination, and they are on the way, both available to you in the Australian guidelines. Thank you. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I again just ask you to uh, thank our panel? It's an excellent uh, presentation. <laughs> Let me also thank all of you for being here this evening and in particular uh, advocates for Wesley Medical Research who make a wonderful contribution financially to the opportunity for us to be working with wonderful clinicians and scientists uh, in what is now um, the infectious disease of the 21st century. So that's uh, wonderful. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, we also um, want to thank you for the opportunity that we have in terms of a broader range of um, life-changing research and treatment options for patients where they need it most. And we believe that you're the backbone of the organisation along with our amazing leadership team and, of course, our staff. So please join me um, and the rest of the team for some refreshments in the boardroom and thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.